Hey folks, Alan Manick, the Hot Rod Hippie here. This week's video, I'm gonna show you how to make some custom battery cables and why I do it. Let's check it out. Let's get one thing out of the way real quick here. If you are looking to make custom battery cables for your project because you think it's gonna be cheaper, you're almost certainly wrong. So whoever's making pre-made cables is buying cable by the hundreds of feet. They're buying ends in bulk. They have all the supplies, tools, and equipment on hand to make that cable it is going to be generally more affordable to buy pre-made lengths than it will be to custom make your own cables. Now that disclaimer out of the way, I'm gonna tell you how, why I make custom battery cables for almost every project that I do, the tools that I use to do them, and I'm gonna show you how to do it. So why is actually really simple. I personally am picky about the way battery cables route. I want them to route in a really nice clean fashion rather than just cutting across the middle of open space. And I also want them to meet specific needs of the vehicles that I'm building. Over the past 10 years, I've mostly been building resto mods where I'm putting newer EFI engines and new sound systems, new AC systems, new wiring systems into old vehicles. So I'm not gonna call up Dan Chuck and order a battery cable for a 1955 Chevy when it's got a trunk mount battery, an LS3 engine, a vintage air AC system, and an American auto wire electrical harness. So as you can see, the batteries mounted in the trunk of this car. I'm using bulkheads that pass the battery cables from inside of the trunk out underneath of the body to run battery cables all the way along the frame of this thing. In this vehicle, I'm running double zero battery cable so I can get a really solid power and ground delivery to this LS3 engine. And like I said, I also do this for looks. I do this for aesthetics. I either want to hide cables or I want them to just flow nice and clean so that they are not sticking out like a sore thumb. A lot of factory vehicles will run the battery cable just kind of floating out there in the middle of nowhere because they don't want to add an extra foot of cable in there because a foot per car on an assembly line can really add up expense wise. For a custom project, we can flow down along an inner fender, down a frame rail, and really have a nice clean line. The 55 Chevy I've been working on, that's what I did. I mounted the maxi fuse under the hood, so it's still easily accessible. It's hidden underneath the AC compressor a little bit, and the battery cable flows along the line of the AC line on that car. So they all flow together. Let's go ahead and run through the supplies we're gonna use, the tools we're gonna use in this, and then we'll whip up this battery cable. First and foremost, obviously we need battery cable. Now this is actually welding cable. There is a difference between welding and battery cable. Welding cable has finer strands in it meant for higher voltage and slightly lower amperage whereas battery cable has heavier strands to basically have more conductor material per foot. I have never found it to really matter personally and welding cable is usually much easier to find and less expensive. So it's gonna be up to you whether or not that matters for your project. As I said, I have never had an issue using welding cable on a car, your mileage may vary. I'm gonna throw a link down below to a chart for sizing battery cables for your project. You're gonna to have to figure out your needs for your individual project and decide what size cable is good enough for you. As I said, on that 55 Chevy, I ran 2-0 on that. But then, did I really need to do that? Probably not. I went a little overkill on that because I'd just be sa rather safe than sorry. If I was building a race car, the additional weight might have been an issue for me, so I might have tried to go as slim as I could. I'm using two gauge for this video simply because I ordered the supplies for this video and for this video alone, and I didn't want to spend the money on double zero gauge just for a video. That's all there is to it. Two gauge is what we're using here just because. So next we need eyelets or battery terminals. Depending on what you're doing, if you're just making round cable that's going from an engine block to a frame, you're probably going to run an eyelet on each end. If you're making one that's going to an actual battery, you're going to need an actual battery terminal. I have just eyelets for this video, but I will discuss what I would do differently if we were actually using terminals. The eyelets that I have for this are pure copper. I buy these specific to my application. When I'm making cables, I pre-plan them for the build. I will actually just size up each one because if I say bought a quarter inch size one and then I try to drill them out for three eighths inch eyelets, it doesn't end well. Yes, I've done it plenty of times. It doesn't work out well in the end. You end up gripping it and bending it or tearing the eyelet open and you end up with a sloppy job. Buy the ones that you need for the specific project you're working on. Next up are battery solder slugs. These are little lumps of solder with flux perfectly sized for each individual eyelet and battery terminal you're working with. These are sized specifically for each size and they're actually colored. I don't know the color code offhand, but they're generally colored for each individual size. 
I got ones here from All Star Performance that are two gauge because we're working with two gauge cable. And last but not least, we have heat shrink tubing. Now this is optional. You don't need to put this on every battery cable you produce. Now this has two benefits. One, it prevents water intrusion getting into that connection and causing corrosion, especially because this is adhesive lines. The adhesive will melt as this shrinks. So it will go ahead and actually glue and seal that connection up so water and moisture can't get into that connection. The other benefit of this is that adhesion also holds a mechanical connection on that cable. As that glue bonds to the cable and it bonds to the terminal end, it will actually glue those two ends together. Now let's get started making our cable. First thing I do is I put an eyelet or a terminal on one end of the cable, even before I decide how long that cable needs to be, because this allows me to bolt it to one end, bolt it to the starter, to bolt it to the battery, and actually route the cable exactly how it's going to go, not just measure and hope that my measurement's gonna end up right. What I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna hold this terminal end up to this cable and mark how much insulation needs to be removed from this cable to allow me to get a good connection on here, but not have too much insulation removed that's gonna cause corrosion or allow water intrusion. There are probably pretty fancy ways to go ahead and actually remove this insulation. I usually use either a razor blade, cable cutters, or I'm using scissors right now, because honestly, it's gonna get the job done. You do have to be careful when doing it this way that you don't end up cutting conductor wires, but this is the way I do it. And a little twist, and it's off. Now that I have my cable stripped back, I have my eyelet here. I stuck my solder slug into my eyelet where it belongs. And then I'm gonna go ahead and stick it in the vise to melt the solder in the eyelet to get the solder connection together. I'm gonna go ahead and grab my handy torch. Hmm. I think I'll go with the newer one. So this will allow me to go ahead and melt the solder. Simple, straightforward torch, nothing special. It just gets the job done quickly, easily, rather than a heat gun or a big soldering iron or something like that. This is definitely the way to go when it comes to doing battery terminals. Now this is a pretty simple process. I fire up the propane torch. I start heating up the eyelet. Once the eyelet gets to the point where the solder it slug melts in the end of it, I can go ahead and stick the battery cable into there. Hardest part of this process is just making sure that you can get all the conductors into the eyelet and don't have some of them sticking out the side. Then I just hold the connection together for a few moments so that the solder has a chance to cool and bite into the battery cable, hold a mechanical connection onto that cable, and then I can take it out of the vise. Now, right after the battery terminal end is soldered together, I will stick it into the battery crimper. Then I just go ahead and move the plunger of the crimper down onto the eyelet, rest it on there, and smack it with a hammer. I wanna hit it again and again until I reach a mark on the side of the plunger that's actually marked for the size of cable that I'm working with. Here I'm working with two gauge, but you see some marks for 2.0, 4.0, that's a double zero and quad zero cable. Now that I have my end both soldered onto here and crimped onto here, I go ahead and cut off a piece of heat shrink tubing. This is an inch and a half long piece. Slide it over there so that it covers up the joint entirely and time to shrink it. You can just see a line of that adhesive that is squeezed out of the heat shrink tubing, and that's letting me know that this is nice and sealed up. That glue is all through here, sealing this wire with the heat shrink tube and sealing these two together. Now I went ahead and threw a second eyelet on the other end of this thing, and I have the hydraulic crimping tool here. I haven't tried this thing yet, so I'm gonna give it a try for the first time right here, right now. Right out of the box, I can tell you there's one issue I've noted already. The jaws, the anvils that actually go into here to squeeze the eyelet end, they don't tell you what size equals what jaws. They're labeled like these say 35, but is that millimeters? It, what is that? It doesn't say anywhere in the instructions what ones go to what ends. Got this in here, time to squeeze. I go till the jaws touch and that should be a good crimp. That left this hexagonal design all the way around here, crimping this eyelet onto the cable. I'm really impressed with that, actually. I think I picked the right size of anvils to go with this two gauge end, though, like I said, I'm gonna have to figure out over time and mark inside of the case or something as to which ones go to which size. All right, now that I got this 25 foot cable with a black end, a red end, and uh, eyelets on each end, yeah, that's gonna be very useful for me. I just wanted to demonstrate for you folks how it is that I actually go about doing this and test out that hydraulic pressing tool. I actually like the crimp that I ended up with. It's gonna be a little bit of a pain in my butt to figure out how to use it in the end, but I think I will stick with using that thing. As always, there are links in the description down below if you wanna check out some of the items here, the battery solder slugs, the cable ends, any of these tools, there'll be links in the description down below for you folks. When it comes to doing the terminal ends, I do the same thing that I do with the eyelets, except I don't crimp them. I usually get the cast design ones. I find that 
different. They're a little bit stronger overall. They seem to last longer. I like the way they look. And you can even get them with a solder already in there, so you don't need a battery slug for those. But because of the cast design, I don't go crimping them, I don't hammer on those, I don't want to be messing with that too much. So I just solder and heat shrink those together. Like I said, the best tip that I can give you is to go ahead and actually mock these up on the car. It can be a real pain in the butt when you're working with a 25 foot of cable like this, if you need to feed it over the frame rail, over the exhaust, around things, whatever you need to do, it's a little bit of a pain to do that but I find that you end up with a much cleaner result because you're actually mocking up the item you're going to be using, where it's going to go before you go cutting it, crimping it, anything like that. And I generally try to leave myself some wiggle room. I try to give my point, myself a point where I have like a service loop or have a, a little extra coming off the battery cable or something like that, that allows me to have some wiggle room. I'm gonna come back to this in the not too distant future. I have a big project coming up very soon where we're gonna be running a lot of battery cable. So I will be showing you my process of actually laying out the cables in place, how I like to route things. And we'll revisit this a little bit in that video as well. All right, folks, that's gonna wrap it up for this video. I now have a 25 foot battery cable with different ends on each end that I have no actual need for, but I demonstrated for you how to produce a battery cable the way I do it. Hope you found this video interesting. If you did, go ahead and drop it a like. Let me know in the comments down below. Do you have any further questions about how to produce battery cables? Something else you want me to demonstrate? Please let me know in the comments down below. Check out the Patreon account, patreon.com slash hotrodhippie that directly supports this channel. I greatly appreciate my patrons because they allow me to make videos like this. This was like $70 worth of material just to produce this one video. I'd love to do more of these, but I can't afford to spend that on materials all the time unless folks really help me out to produce these videos. So thank you and please check that out. Subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with all the content every week. Thanks for coming around, folks.